Hello, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. And especially um, thanks Catherine Kutchenbecker for coming all the way. It's great to have you here. Um, Catherine, she's a director at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems at Stuttgart, where she leads the uh, Haptic Intelligent Department since 2017. And um, before that, she spent about 10 years maybe at DUPenn at the Grasp Lab as faculty. And uh, before that, PhD at Stanford and a postdoc at uh, Johns Hopkins. There you go. And throughout all of that time, uh, she's been a leader in the field of touch. Um, and touch for many reasons, but uh, I would highlight two, right? Touch for haptics and teleoperation uh, for human machine interfaces, as well as haptics for, uh, as a means for feedback for autonomous machines and in manipulation. Um, so, which I believe we're gonna hear about more today, the second part maybe. Um, so it's an honor to have you here, Catherine. Thanks for joining. And um, thanks for um, all the effort to come from Europe. It is my great pleasure Thank to be you. here. Thank you for the kind introduction, Alberto. And welcome, everyone. I'm really happy to have a chance to tell you about uh, my research. As Alberto said, I'm Catherine Kuchenbecker. And I thought I would start. You already covered pretty much everything. The only thing you didn't say is that I'm American, not German. People often think because I'm coming from Germany. And my name, Kuchenbecker, it means cake baker. I had German ancestors. But I grew up in Southern California in LA. And then I went to Stanford. Uh, you might have heard of it. It's a university in Northern California. And I studied. I got all of my degrees there in mechanical engineering. So I come from more an ME background. But I always took a lot of classes in electrical engineering, computer science. And I was really drawn uh, to interactive systems with sensors and actuators. And my PhD advisor uh, was this guy, Gunter Niemeyer. And he was an MIT alum. He got his PhD here at MIT with Jean-Jacques Flatine studying time delayed teleoperation. Then he also did a postdoc here with Ken Salisbury, who was here at MIT at the time before he moved to Stanford. And then he worked at Intuitive Surgical. He was one of the first engineers in Intuitive Surgical and helped invent uh, the Da Vinci robot, um, which uh, is used for minimally invasive teleoperated robotic surgery. And yeah, I was his first PhD student. I graduated there in 2006. And I did a one-year postdoc uh, with Allison Okamura at Johns Hopkins. She is now at Stanford. She was also a wonderful mentor. And then I started my faculty career. I went to Penn. I was there for nine and a half years, not quite 10, approximately nine and a half. And I was part of the Grass Lab, which was a, an interdisciplinary, it still is. Uh, they're hosting ICRA, in a, or they're run, uh, in charge of why ICRA is going to Philadelphia. Um, and so yeah, it's this robotics interactive perception lab between computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and also some biomedical engineering there. And I was really, really happy there. Uh, but one day, I got an email saying, hey, Catherine, you know, we're this institute, this relatively new institute in Germany, and we have an open director position. We were wondering if you want to come, give a talk, get to know some people. And that was in January of 2015. And so I flew to Germany, and I got to know this institute that had only been founded. Uh, so in southern Germany, we have two sites, one in Stuttgart and one in Tübingen. Um, and it was, had only been founded in 2011. And it was basically a redirection. The Max Planck Society is a basic curiosity-driven uh, research institution spread all over Germany, a few around the world. Germany is basically taking taxpayer money and investing in basic research. And they had founded or redirected this institute that used to be doing metals research, material science, into intelligent systems, which is basically AI and robotics, very interdisciplinary. And I'm really lucky that I was selected to join this institute and become a director there. And maybe you know some of the other people, depending on your background. If you, um, there are people like Alexander Badr Spurbitz, who does legged locomotion, maybe similar to uh, Sangbei Kim. Uh, or the other directors along the top were like the endowed full professors. Metin City, I know, has visited uh, MIT many times. And I just mentioned this because in case you're an undergrad or a master's student or a PhD student or someone looking for a job, whether you're looking for a PhD position or a postdoc position or a group leader position or even we have two open director positions, people should consider uh, it's a really nice life in Europe. And at Max Planck, we have really good conditions for doing research. So uh, maybe you know someone who's looking for a PhD position, and they should apply to IMPRS, IS, which is this big PhD program that I run. We have lots of faculty also with 
with our two local universities, but I know you're probably very happy here at MIT and I'm not trying to steal you. I just want you to know maybe you want to make a future career step. There's someone in the audience who used to be a PhD student in our institute and is now here, and I think we often move around and go to many places over our careers and through that learn uh, about science and about research in different places. This is my team. It's the most important slide in the whole presentation. Uh, I have about 15 PhD students currently and some postdocs. These are along the bottom. Uh, People used to be postdocs and research scientists with me who now moved on to run their own labs, and I'm still collaborating with many of them. And we have lots of different visitors over the years, including someone else in the audience, Karen Nunez, who is a visiting PhD student with me for two years, and uh, is now a postdoc at Harvard, and I told her I was here speaking. So I'm going to tell you about some research that we do. What is common about, although it might seem cacophonous, like if you go, go look at our website and you'll be like, why is this one lab studying so many different things? There is actually a common thread, and it's, I think, quite fundamental and something that all of us should be interested in. And that is a fascination with the sense of touch and the fact that it's really important and underappreciated, I think. Um, it's, our it's really fundamental to us as humans, how we interact with the world. It's the first sense that we have to evolve. If you are ever unlucky enough to have your sense of touch malfunction, it is very, very difficult to compensate for compared to, say, uh, de de degradation in vision or hearing. Uh, it's really, really difficult to control your motions and your contact with the world if you cannot feel the consequences of your motion. Um, it is also very fundamentally coupled to movement and social interaction. And then finally, it's spread throughout your body. It's not, you can't just pinpoint it. So I think in that way, it's harder to understand or kind of wrap your hands around, wrap your brain around. Uh, and so if I think about the sense of touch or haptics, I would usually split it into two main kinds of things. One is tactile sensations, things we feel in our skin, and the other is kinesthetic receptors deeper in our body. And some people, times people call tactile sensations cutaneous. And here we're talking about where are things touching me? How are they touching me? Are they pushing? Are they stretching? Are they slipping across? Is something vibrating against my skin? Or is something I'm holding in my hand vibrating as I drag it along? I've done a lot of work on things like that. Um, is something exchanging temperature with me, heating up my skin or cooling it down? Also, we have a little bit of proximity sensing in our hair follicle receptors. It's important to know, don't just assume that on a camera, all the pixels are all the same size. In your sense of touch, the receptor density varies a lot over your, the space of your body. So like your fingertips have a lot of mechanoreceptors and less, and then totally other kinds of mechanoreceptors in other places in your body, and not as good, but maybe good at other things. So all that's like the surface of your body. And then your kinesthetic system, also your proprioceptive system, is telling you more about the pose of your body. So you can feel the lengths of your muscles. Are they contracting or extending? The forces that um, tendons are undergoing and a little bit of your joint receptors. These are more like um, sensors that a robot would often have about its own pose in the world. Um, and your, your brain, your body is constantly combining these two streams of information to make sense of your interactions with the world and guide them uh, to what to the consequent, to the goal that you want to have. And traditionally, I think tactile sensations have been underappreciated, underexploited, and we're seeing a big explosion in their use in robotics and also in haptic feedback for humans. And I think that's very exciting because it's such a rich and uh, there's so many different kinds of cues um, where touch matters more than just movement in the world. And so now that I've told you how important the sense of touch is, you might then be shocked or surprised or frustrated to find out why are so many engineering systems that we're designing and building products we can buy, they often neglect our sense of touch as a user, as a human. And what do I mean by that? I think computers or robots sense of people, we have eyes, clearly they present visual stimuli to us, they, they play some audio, and maybe there's a little bit of stimulus for your hands, but not very much. Touch screens can certainly feel where you touch, but when I touch things on the screen of a computer, this is my cat, Toby, I cannot feel his fur or the fabric that he's sitting on. I cannot uh, touch products um, or anything uh, digitally. It feels me, but there's no digital tactile sensation back to me. The same is true in virtual reality. I can move around in VR, but I make contact with objects and don't feel anything, and that takes away um, a normal feedback channel that you're used to having. Um, we also can't interact physically. Professor Harry Hassan and I were talking right before about telemedicine and interacting with a patient between a doctor, and they can't physically reach out and touch you or help guide you, either to make a personal connection or to physically shape and help assist you. This is a big kind of connection that is missing in remote interactions. Uh, I mentioned robotic surgery is what Gunter had uh, developed. We have This is my lab in, in Germany where we have a da Vinci system, and we've invented ways of bringing some haptic feedback into there, but normally, the 
commercial robots, the ones that are in the hospitals here in Boston and all over the world. The surgeons are operating only with vision, so stereo vision, but they cannot feel anything about what the instruments can feel. And I think this is part of why this technology has not delivered as much of the benefits that were promised in terms of the surgery of the future. If you're operating with no sense of touch, it is that is a handicap that is somewhat compensated by really good vision, um, but not completely. Um, also, robots themselves, as Alberto mentioned, rarely have tactile sensors. Now, just so now we're starting to see them in, in good ones in research labs and being used, but they're far from standardized. They're har far from widely available. You pretty much have to make your own tactile sensors or buy ones and adapt them and improve them. Uh, and then also social robots. So whether instead of a robot being in charge of just uh, or responsible for picking things up, robots that interact with people also. This is a now robot, very, very commonly used. Uh, it has some tactile sensors on the top of its hands and head and uh, bumpers on its toes. So you basically can't feel when you touch it. And that, in my opinion, needs to change for robots to um, be able to help us better in, in our daily lives. And so I would say like the mission, overall mission of a lot of the work that we do is to help physical interaction and touch tactile cues play a more prominent role to better deliver on uh, the benefits of humans interacting with the world or with technology and robots interacting with the world. And so we work in five main areas. And I'll just go through the first three very quickly, and then I'll focus in on the last two as the main bulk of the talk today. And please, if you have any questions or comments, just speak up, raise your hand. Uh, I'll pause for questions uh, four times later after the four main projects. Uh, but this, I'm happy for this to be very interactive. Um, yeah. So first, we work on a fingertip haptics. This is like the most fundamental area. We're looking off actually at the mechanics between finger and tip interactions and screens or surfaces or materials and how to make devices that present sensations at our fingertips. We do a lot of other work on haptic interface technology. Sometimes what is shown on the left is a shape changing device for guidance. On the right is Haptify, this big instrumented platform we created to bring grounded force feedback devices and measure what you feel as you move around so we can quantify their performance. How close to perfect free space are they? How stiff are they? Do they actually run or what you're supposed to feel as you're touching digital objects. Um, and then we do a lot of work on teleoperation, adding haptic feedback, and also understanding how um, a human comes to control the machine over time and how you learn and how we can speed up your learning or quantify your skill. Um, and then uh, we are doing a lot of work on physical, social, physical, and just physical human robot interaction and tactile sensing, touch sensing. And it's these last two that I wanted to focus on in my talk today. And I will give a disclaimer there. Uh, I gave a very similar talk at the Embodied Intelligence Conference a few weeks ago, so I'm sorry if you heard that. It's recorded on, on YouTube. I'll try to give it a different flavor today, but it's mostly the same uh, things that I spoke about that day. Um, and why I chose these two uh, for the overall topic of embodied intelligence or AI and robotics, there are a lot of advances in touch sensing, and I see them as critical as in enabling new forms of physical human robot interaction. Robots are often in a cage far away. We don't go near them. What are they missing to enable them to work near people, around people, safely in unstructured environments? I think they need a sense of touch. We need better touch sensors that are not just a tactile sensor on the desk, but something that can be practical and actually integrated with a robot, which is a lot harder than it sounds. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. And once we have new ideas of what a human, what a robot could be able to do, maybe that also gives us some new ideas for touch sensing. Maybe if we just think about touch sensing in the abstract compared to in a particular application on a robot, we might get some new ideas of what touch sensing could look like uh, and where we should focus our efforts. And so my dream touch sensors uh, were somewhat inspired by early work that I had done with my very first PhD student who lives here in the Boston area, and I'm going to see him on Monday. Um, his name is Joe Romano. And we were working on haptics. Uh, he, was the, he and I did haptic capture and, um, t for textures and tapping. Uh, but he did an internship at Willow Garage, which is the company. It was a startup company in uh, the Bay Area that had made this robot, the personal robot, too. And we had a, he did an internship product, project there where we wanted the robot to see and pick up all these objects, different real objects. Um, and we took inspiration from neuroscience. We tried to understand how the different mechanoreceptors in the human fingertips fire at like the start of contact or when the object you're holding uh, leaves the ground or hits something, and tried to emulate those bio-inspired signals with the very, very simple tactile sensors that the robot have. And at the time, they were really primitive. You can see up here, they were just a three by five pressure cells on the fingertips, but they were very hysteretic, nonlinear, and they had a, um, 
a very low sampling rate, like 23 hertz, if I remember. But luckily, there was also an accelerometer, uh, a vibration sensor in the hand. And so we could use those two sources of information to emulate, uh, and yeah, this is picking up and setting down an egg, uh, to try to emulate some of the same transient that we see in being useful, essential in human motor control with tactile cues. This was very uh, um, helpful. We did, uh, or this was. It really, I'm really glad we did this, but there wasn't a lot more that we could do with those tactile pressure sensors. We wanted to do more. Same time, Joe got us started doing human-robot interactions. So he programmed this little demo called PR2 Props. He did high fives and then also fist bumps uh, because he said, you know, no, one, the cool people don't do high fives, Catherine. The cool thing to do is to do fist bumps and double fist bumps and explode. And so we programmed this demo. It's been shown to tons and tons of kids and people all around the world. And the way it works. It's not using vision to detect the contacts, it's feeling them using the accelerometer in its hand. So it's moving through a very simple trajectory and it's feeling a, an event and then reacting and it creates a really satisfying, fun um, demo. Then I had another project where we were using the same robot um, but to do grounded language learning. So this was a collaboration with Trevor Darrell at University of California, Berkeley, through, funded through DARPA. Uh, those were the main researchers, Vivian, Ian, and Lorenzo. Ian lives here in, the, in Boston, too. I'm going to see him tomorrow, too. Um, but we installed painstakingly these biotech sensors, which were developed for prosthetic fingers, uh, on the robot by machining new parts and running our own wires and running all these drivers. And it was, it was kind of a mess. But there we could get these really detailed multimodal tactile sensors, or maybe not even as detailed, nowhere near as detailed as gel site or current modern sensors. But at the time, this was like mind blowing that you could really get distributed pressure. And so yeah, we used these biotechs and had a lot of fun using them. Uh, they provide multimodal input, which I was really glad to have. So shape and then internal pressure, vibration, and temperature. These 19, on, on the negative side though, there are these 19, I don't know if any of you have ever used a biotech. It, there's a fluid, like a conductive fluid inside a, ro a rubber shell outside. And then as you push on the outside, that moves around. And it's an, kind of an impedance tomography, but not even impedance tomography. You, it's measuring the uh, resistance, basically, from any one of those little electrodes to ground. And so when the skin is impinged or is bulging, the, the resistance goes up or goes down. So you get these 19 readings, but they're not even displacements. They're definitely not forces. Um, but they work well for things like machine learning. But to physically interpret them, it's not so easy. They also drift a lot over time. It's compact and small, but, um, but you only get a sensitive area on one side, not on the back. And they're really delicate. We broke so many of these. They're rather difficult. They're maybe like $15,000. And it's really easy to break that little cable. And then it's broken forever. And you need another one. And then you buy another one. And then you break it. And then you're, you're sad. So I also don't see this particular sensing approach extending over an entire robot. And I would like my robot to have more than just tactile sensitive fingertips. I would love a sensor touch all over it. But still, this work that we did really got me addicted to. Uh, tactile sensing and also seeing we need new tactile sensors and to processing that data and how to give robots a sense of touch so they can understand what they're touching in real time. So from that early work that I did, like early when I was at Penn, I came up with some wish list. And uh, so if I could have my wish, and we're also trying to develop towards these, I would love tactile sensors that are soft so that they don't damage things, so we can control contact more easily, that cover my robot, all of the robot. I want all of the robot, right? We want to cover the whole, the whole robot. Uh, I think it's especially important to tell the difference between contact and no contact. And this sounds trivial, but it's really not. Because when you're moving around, if you, here, just move your arms around, you feel stuff as your body moves around. There's self-sensation. and. Um, things change and drift, and so really not being able to identify the in start of new contact, because that's when the dynamics of physics of contact, the robots uh, change. I think that's really important. We need high dynamic range, so good sensitivity at low input uh, forces, but keep responding. Don't just clip. We want to be able to keep feeling higher and higher forces. Uh, so nonlinear, we want to respond quickly. We can't have a lot of time delays. Uh, I want to be able to react fast. Um, the information needs to be useful, and that might depend on um, sometimes maybe it's crucial to know the location of contact. And other times, you don't need to know exactly where contact is happening. And I think often we have an assumption it's a tactile sensor. I need to be able to localize contact. But I'll show you some examples where that's actually not important. And if we relax that constraint, we can make a system that's much easier and much more functional and much cheaper and much more robust. 
Um, so you have to think, really, what, what does my robot need in this situation? Yeah, has to be robust, has to be reliable. We have to be able to keep using the sensors over and over. They're going to be abused um, by the people, by the robot. Um, and they have to be able to integrate with our robots well. I would love them to be low cost to the extent that that's possible and that lots of people could use them. So we'll get more, more tactile sensors around the world. So that's my wish list. And then I'm going to show you four projects that I think we're making steps toward these. Of course, there's lots of great research around the world. And especially here, I've had a really nice time visiting many labs. And I know I'm visiting a few more this afternoon. So uh, I'm just going to show you four projects that we have done. And maybe they're interesting to you. And I'll stop after each of them to take comments and questions. And we'll just go from left to right. And we'll start with Insight. Um, in each case, I'm going to highlight the people behind it. So Juan Bosun is the main PhD student. He's Georg Marcius's PhD student. He's about to graduate. Uh, and he is absolutely brilliant. So if someone needs a postdoc, uh, I would highly encourage you to hire Juan Bosun. And Iris is our new, Garrig and I have a new PhD student who's continuing this project. And we published this in February, just a couple months ago, in Nature Machine Intelligence. And this is, I'm just going to tell you about this new sensor that we made. So it's called Insight. And it's a camera-based uh, tactile sensor, certainly taking inspiration from GelSight. But it has some different features. Um, so we use a, we 3D print an, a metal skeleton and then overmold it with a single layer of elastomer. And we mix uh, silicone Ecoflex with aluminum powder and aluminum flake. So it's opaque, so light cannot get inside. There's a camera inside with some LEDs. Um, and it has a good reflective property and a nice like pattern, like a bumpy pattern inside. Uh, but this makes the insight very strong, but also very sensitive. Um, and it's really easy to manufacture. So we just overmold it once, and there's no like coating that can get damaged. It's very robust, and we can use it for a really long time. And yeah, there's an LED ring that projects red, green, and blue structured light inside to illuminate the inside. And then the camera, small little camera with the fisheye lens, is looking out at the inside of the skin. And what our data processing pipeline, we take pictures of what the camera sees inside of the sensor. And then we compare that with a reference image. And then look at the difference. We pass that through a ResNet, a deep neural net. Um, and we produce a force map. So this is three channels. Each location is x, y, z force. Each pixel corresponds to one little point on the surface of the sensor. So we can read out a whole vector field of the forces contacting that we estimate happening on the, on the finger at any one time. And here's like a little visualization. And it's quite nice and local and directional. So some key design components. I was already talking about the mechanics. Um, this soft, hard um, elastomer for robustness and strength and sensitivity. Um, the lighting also was important to get it's um, to just get different colors in different locations and good distribution, not overexposing or underexposing any regions. Um, and so that's the light. Then we do machine learning. We do end to end from original image all the way to force map training. So we need a lot of data to under to learn that mapping. So Juanbo built a little robot. You can see this like basically a 3D printer gantry moving around, and then a two more degrees of freedom rotate the sensor, bring it to different angles. And it just sits there all day, all weekend, all week, being pressed by a little hemisphere. And then we label that image with, and it comes down and touches in the normal direction and also in the shear direction. So we get like 20 or 30 um, little uh, camera images that are matched so you can like see the contact happening here. This is where the camera sees it. Then this is like close to what the label is that we give it. And then we do uh, the learning end-to-end -end training, as I was saying. We give it a label of a force map, and then it learns this. And then in real time, sorry, this is probably even easier to see. So this is Juanbo touching the sensor at different locations. And at the upper right, you can see the output of the force map rendered in three dimensions. So if you watch on the picture here, you can see what the camera is seeing. And it's able to infer this vector field of 3D forces across its surface. And you can touch, um, maybe I'll jump ahead in the video. It goes, stops going slow, and it starts going fast in a moment. I'm not good enough with the mouse. Ah, here, it's going to go fast now. This is the part I want to see. Now he's touching it in more than one place, and you can see the multiple contact points and that it's angled. And so, yeah, so that is insight. Yes, please. The texture that we see in the tactile image, yeah. is that physical it's, texture? It's molded, yeah. So the inner surface of insight has these ridges. We did some like mechanical ablation studies where we tried with a smooth surface. It's in the supplementary materials for this article. Or yeah, it is smooth or texture. But I think the texture just helps uh, you see shear better. 
So if you like watch here, they're kind of like markers. They're not like dot markers. Like a, 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 we didn't want to have to paint or have a very special printer. We wanted to make this as accessible as possible. So it's just over molded with uniform consistency, silicone, the silver, but the texture that's 3D printed into the mold. So uh, we 3D print the mold uh, and that has this um, kind of waffle texture to give like a better ability to see the, the how the individual points on the surface move, also in the shear direction. Yeah? You noticed that you have only two LEDs, two blue LEDs and three red ones. And three yeah, there are only two, two blue LEDs and three red and three green because uh, the camera ended up being more sensitive to blue light and, the, and there were, it was elegant to have eight LEDs in a circle. I, uh, it's just, yeah, but I think it's, if you read, I think we say it's because the camera was more sensitive to the blue channel, so we dimmed down the blue or we didn't need as much blue. I think it could work with other things. I think it's just important that two neighboring colors are different. So then you also get a, a hint when you get really large deformations, the color is also changing. Um, and if it was all red, we also ran ablation studies on the computational side where we took out the color and just did intensity, and it cannot do, I think it can still do normal force reasonably well, but it can't do the shear as well. I think it, again, needs, the, the shear is much harder, I think, than the normal to estimate. Yeah, here. Did you find that the, did you explore whether the learned model was transferable across devices, or? Did we explore, I'm gonna repeat the question, I realize we have remote viewers. Did we explore whether learn model is, is transferable? No. We did not ever put on another, I think we maybe did in practice, but not in a formal way in the experiment. We say it should be, in theory, uh, transfer reasonably well, but no. So this is why we had to have a new PhD student. You see, Juanbo is ready to graduate, and he's done, he's written lots of other papers that are cool. And so Iris, her whole PhD, uh, I think, is going to be getting into more of these details and also putting the sensor on a robot and using it um, in practical ways. Um, we were able to achieve with the sensor an overall spatial resolution of about 0.4 millimeters over this uh, surface of about the size of your thumb. We get very accurate force magnitudes and very accurate angle measurements. Um, and yeah, as a, a side note, we realized that even if we rotate the sensor relative to gravity, it can see, it can infer the direction of gravity because the soft, knit, soft shell is like hanging in different ways. You can't see it visually, but you can see it in the difference images, which kind of blew our minds. It was really sensitive. So that was all I wanted to tell you about Insight. I'll go back to showing you Juanbo and Georg and Iris, our PhD student who's working on a small version and lots of other things. And she is making multiple shells and we should definitely try to trans see how well it transfers. Um, she's, yeah, we're trying lots of things. We'll publish, I think we'll submit our first paper with Iris in a few months. So yeah, at the back of the room. The situation will look like? Could you say again? The training, the uh, data gathering process. Yeah, so this is definitely, uh, it was just sitting for days and poking on the sensor uh, in normal and shear, and we gathered a pretty big data set. And then in the paper also there's an ablation study where we tried to do less, uh, train with less, and I think with about only 10% of what we ended up collecting was sufficient, and it didn't improve that much over, but I still was kind of a lot of data. So. What strikes me, uh, and afterwards you're always like, why did we do that? Um, this whole system to like go around and touch the robot, uh, uh, touch the sensor, it's like a robot. And so what we're doing with ears is actually just putting the sensor on a robot and have that be the calibration. Like the rig, the, the robot itself has its skin and moves around and touches things in the world and uh, hopefully we can have it learn that way but not destroy itself. Um, but we'll see, it, this is definitely, it was all supervised learning so there was a big data set that had to be collected at the beginning. Um, yeah, and in the paper we try to give indication of how much data you actually might need. Any other questions or comments? You guys have great questions. Okay, we gotta keep going, we have three more projects. All right, so that was Insight. Now ERTAC, this is Electrical Resistance Tomography Tactile Sensor, uh, and this is led by Hyo Sang Lee, who used to be a postdoc research scientist. Now he's an independent group leader at the University of Stuttgart, our neighboring university. We have visiting PhD students, other people involved, also Juan Boer and Georg again, and Jung Kim from KAIST uh, was a big collaborator on this project. We published many papers. I'm just gonna highlight one, which was published in Smart Materials and Structures last year. This was like our first journal article on the idea explaining how it works. So now instead of fingertips, I'm thinking about the rest of the robot. How are we going to endow the rest of the robot? And we don't need that fine detail, normal and shear sensing that we have in InSight um, or other like fingertip like tactile sensors. We want broad coverage and simplicity, robustness. And so what we do, 
Um, we have, we are working with sheet materials that we can wrap around rigid body parts of robots and it's a piezo resistant material and we inter populate it with little electrodes and then we're measuring the resistance between um, different locations. And the principle is if I inject current from one place to another, it will flow. And if then I come and press in there and pressure reduces the uh, resistance locally, then by measuring other voltage, pairs of voltages, I can measure voltage differences, I can reconstruct uh, the voltage, I can measure the voltage difference, I can reconstruct the resistance distribution, and then through calibration, I can know the force distribution that must be applied. And so the way we make this like laminated structure, we have uh, conductive, so low resistance patches on top of this like high resistance fabric. And so when there's no pressure, the electricity has to flow just through the low resistance fabric at the bottom. And then when you push in from the top, you change the contact resistance locally uh, and we can get like, uh, it's faster and it can kind of jump up to the top layer and have a lower resistance in that small region. And then we have a bunch of different electrodes all around and we scan really, really fast and do a reconstruction. So everything is sewn and fabricated from laminates. And that's where you can see we like 3D or um, we cut with a laser cutter the conductive patches and then assemble them on. And we have these little electrodes that are sewn. Uh, and there's a lot of electronics. They're scanning across and applying current and measuring resistances. There's also some mathematics in there, which we're using a forward, like a simple physical model to go from the voltage measurements to the conductivity distribution. And then we use more physical measurements to go from all the way to the pressure field. Um, we have also done a lot with checking, the, figuring out what is a more optimal scan pattern. You don't need to measure every pairwise um, voltage. You also don't need to apply current in every pair. There are certain ones. Uh, it is most useful to apply current from and to electrodes that are very far apart. And to do that, to try to scan, because you're most sensitive on the path between this, this electrode and that electrode. So anyway, we build up a pattern of uh, the sampling. And then we can look at, here we were doing localization. So we had a probe that would push at different locations and we were getting down to about eight millimeters across. This is a 200 millimeter by 200 millimeter sen sensor. We now have one that's 600 by 600 in our lab, really big. And we're also doing two point discrimination. So it's nowhere near as good as your finger, but it's close to like a human stomach or a human back. Um, and we can do pretty good force. So it's not just knowing where contact is, but also knowing how hard something is pushing, but there's no shear, right? We're just doing local contact normal force and contact area and amplitude of normal force, but not anything with shear. So here are some demos on the left, uh, a single point contact. Um, this is Yosang pressing and pushing. This is a real time reconstruction. So you can see, um, where he pushes, it's very sensitive. The contact regional area, it's a little bit blurred because we're doing an inference problem. It's an inverse problem and we're, it, so contacts get smeared, but it's very sensitive in terms, it, it's pretty good in the location and it's very sensitive in terms of the magnitude of the forces. And you only need a very small number of wires um, and it's pretty robust. Um, we also, just to highlight the impact of the calibration, this is a constant weight. And so ideally when I move this around, when you move this around, you should always get the same pressure readings. And a lot of other people who've done sensors kind of like this are usually just going to resistance change. But the, the mapping from resistance to force varies spatially. So we calibrate for that and it gives more accurate results. So it should always be the same force. So yeah, that was the team and that was the paper. There's lots more stuff that we've done in this direction if this is interesting to you. And Hyosang will continue running with it uh, as an independent scientist. Uh, this transactions on Mechatronics paper I really like. It's about adaptively changing the scan pattern after you feel contact. Like then let's dedicate more effort into scanning more here um, and then but keep a, a broad field. And then I feel another contact here and scan more there so you can get even faster scan rates uh, in the regions of interest so you can um, kind of I like it because it's adapting. And then it's our most recent paper that was just accepted recently and we're doing, have a big simulation and we're using deep learning to bridge from simulation to just a small number of experiments to try to do um, better contact prediction on a really big version of this sensor. Does anyone have any questions or com comments about this set of work that I wanted to show you today? Um, Please. So yeah. I imagine if you covered the different lengths of the robot arm with this, uh, uh, kind of sensor when I'm moving and is my link is changing the link pose and, and maybe the, 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 the uh, pressure sense sensing will be different at the different places and whether they will have a consistent. This is a great question. So she's asking, you're asking, 
would, if I actually put this on the robot, so here we're doing something that's not what I would recommend. We just have a sensor on the desk and we're not actually moving it around. So I completely agree that we need to put the sensor on, the, on robots and have them move around. I don't believe, the sensor is nowhere near as sensitive as Insight, so I don't think it will actually feel its own weight or gravity. As long as the link is pretty rigid, I think we'll only feel, that I think the readings shouldn't change that much, but this remains to be proven. We haven't done it. Um, I think this falls generally into a category of um, a crosstalk kind of between our motor actions and our sensory signals. And often as engineers, we would really like them to be very clearly divided, and I don't want anything showing up on my sensors, but I think this is inevitable, and humans and animals have this, and have the, they have learned to uh, compensate for it or even to use it to your system's advantage. Maybe the tactile sensations that your robot feels as it moves uh, gives it some better estimate of its own pose. So your skin is actually contributing to your sense of proprioception and there are illusions where they can stretch your skin and make you think your joints are bending even though they're not. So there's more connections between tactile and proprioceptive perception in humans and animals than in robots. But it needs to be handled. Um, I had helped, we had a student apply for a Fulbright, unfortunately it wasn't selected, but uh, we wanted to work on the, a different kind of tactile sensor, the next one I'm gonna show you, and how to handle the robot's own motion and really dig into that. But it's something I wanna work on, but we haven't yet. But yeah, but hopefully coming soon. All right, maybe we should move to the next one, which is uh, Hera, the haptic empathetic robot animal, and this is the doctoral thesis of Rachel Burns. Uh, Hyosung is also on this project, and you can see some of the others. Uh, Hasti Safi was a postdoc with me. She's now an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. She's been doing the, all the learning on this project. So here, what Rachel wanted to do, she has a lot of experience in social robotics and also uh, personal experience with children with autism and wanted to create a robot with lots of input from therapists. So this first paper in Paladin from last year, uh, she went and interviewed lots of therapists who work with children with autism and asked them about the touch habits and opportunities for using robots and robots that could actually feel touch with children with autism. So in this paper, we wrote a whole list of guidelines for what tactile sensor should be, what a robot would need to do to be able to work as a companion with children with autism. And then in this paper, which was just accepted about a month ago in Frontiers in Robotics and AI, we show what we think is a good direction to go for this and how to cover a now robot with tactile sensors. So I'm going to tell you about that Frontiers paper. Um, and yeah. So as I said, uh, Rachel wants to create this koala robot. So a now in a koala costume that can also feel where, which body part you touch, when, and how you touch it. Um, and we're working today, oh yeah, what I'll show you today is mainly about its tactile perceptual system. So there have been many tactile sensors in the world and we chose a very simple approach because we want this almost to be like a do-it-yourself that many people could make tactile sensors like this. So we have a top and bottom electrodes. There's no effort to localize contact. We just have this conductive foam, this piezo-resistive foam between top and bottom electrodes. And then when you push, you are locally changing the resistance and we're just doing resistance between the two. So it's very, very simple. We use heat tape to fuse them together. Uh, and we have electrodes. We have a whole guide with, I'll show you a video in a moment of how to fabricate this. It turns out you shouldn't make them flat. You need to make them molded onto the robot's body so that they fit and then you don't have to deform them to fit because that's just like pressing. So they need to be molded to fit the parts of the robot's body. That means you have to cut the pieces progressively larger on the outside. In retrospect, it all seems clear, but in the beginning you make them and you're like, this doesn't work and I wrap it around and it depresses. So here's a little video that Rob Faulkner, who's one of the co-authors, created. He's just showing these are the parts that we need, uh, how we make these. Like It's almost like a suit of armor that the now can wear, but it's tactically sensitive. So like soft body. So he just goes around and he measures the robot body part and he draws a pattern. You could also do this um, on a computer with drafting software. Um, but he then hand draws. It's like tailoring tactile sensors to robots. And with the paper, we, we give our patterns for how to make these tactile sensors. Um, and we hope to release later this year like a whole body um, set of sensors. And then you heat, use heat to fuse them together in place around, that's a mug press, uh, or you can also use a, an iron like this. And then you just install them on the robot. So that's what they look like. And yeah, you solder some wires to them and put them on your robot. And then your now robot has 
sensitive skin so far. We put it just on the left arm. So there's a shoulder, upper arm, lower arm, and hand. Um, and we ran a study where we brought people into the lab and had them touch the robot uh, on each of the locations in different ways. So here's a demonstration of one of our participants energetically stroking the robot's hand. And here's the data you can see streaming across. The blue line is the hand. And now she's going to energetically hit the robot hand. Again, blue is the hand. People didn't want to hit the robot. It was actually very stressful for many of them. Um, and then now we're going to do energetic tickling on the robot's hand. Uh, oh, the video doesn't go that far. But So we had two intensity levels, gentle and energetic. I think we had hitting, poking, squeezing, stroking, and tickling. And these were taken from feedback that the therapist had given us on the shoulder, upper arm, lower arm, or hand. And the data are really rich. They're, there's a lot of detail, but it's just the whole body part. But then we, yeah, we had these 15 people. They came in and do this. And then we went through and labeled the windows. And then we did some simple machine learning. So we take some statistics from the windows of the data. And she trained, Hasti trained a random forest to uh, recognize uh, which body part, either none, hand, lower, upper, or the shoulder, which intensity level, which of the gestures, or this is intensity and uh, gesture together. And it actually gets better for some, because sometimes if you're, um, it's easier to know if it's, you're trying to jointly figure out uh, its energetic tickling, or and for some it gets a little bit worse. Also, different people um, gesture in very different ways. So one person's energetic hitting is another person's gentle hitting. So, but we tried to do a very, very natural data collection. And ha we also released the whole data set. If anyone wants to play with the data, you can um, probably do even better. We also asked user opinions about the robot. Um, they, were, they didn't feel threatened or afraid. Uh, their impressions significantly increased after when they first met the robot and afterwards. And they didn't think they were going to break it. They thought it was good, safe, and useful, which are good. Um, so that is that paper. We have a lot more ongoing work, uh, both on how the robot should react when it feels touches, and trying to put together this whole tactile sensor um, system for the robot so that the eventual goal would be uh, we can have a now robot that you could pat or pet or hit, and it would react in an authentic way and maybe help you. Uh, if you were a child with autism, better learn to touch others and to touch in a more socially appropriate way with your therapist. Do you have any questions about this project? Yeah, please, at the back. For every piece of armor, you only get one scalar signal. True. For every rigid link in the robot, we get only one time-varying sensor signal. Yeah. And as a purpose, it seems simple, maybe too simple, but I think from what the therapist said, they weren't interested in knowing exactly where. It, you could certainly make two sensors using the same approach. You could split a body segment into two pieces, upper and lower, or you can tile it more. But every each one is going to be another analog input, another set of wires, another source of complexity, another thing that can break. And so our philosophy on this project is to try to keep it as simple as possible. And I think there's a lot of richness in the data over time. And if I'm touching like this, I don't need to know that I'm moving from here to here pattern, I can still pick out that there is enough signature in the data. So, But I'm sure there will be a limitation. There will be things we cannot do. There's actually some mechanical coupling even locally it's because the, the soft, the suit. So let's say you're like stroking the robot from low to high. You actually see crosstalk to the neighboring sensors when you're close. So you are kind of like listening to the two neighboring sensors too. You can get a little bit of local. By, it's, it's kind of like super resolution, but not really. It is a very simple approach, but I think it has some merit. And can I want to see how far it can get us. Yes, Harry. Yeah. So uh, how is it used for autism? Uh, uh, yet, or? it's not yet used for autism. If you read the first, I'm sorry I didn't go into any details on this. So what Rachel and I envision is that we would uh, have a play session between a therapist and the child with autism and the robot. And the robot has its, this touch sensing capability. And they would do activities like, uh, if the child uh, is playing with a robot or they're interacting, and the, if the child touches the robot nicely or not nicely. What our therapist, the therapist we interviewed said, children with autism tend to be in two categories, either very touch-seeking or very touch-aversive. And so um, often they need help learning how to touch appropriately, either much more gently and calmly or 
to touch at all, and they don't want to touch at all. So there would be different goals for a different child, depending on which category they would be in. Um, and yeah, uh, uh, now robots and other robots have been used extensively in, with children with autism, and it's not something I've worked on a lot. But the main thing we wanted to do was to give such robots uh, a sense of touch, so that if and when the child touches the robot, it would know and be able to react and give them feedback about that contact. There's a lot of history. We take some inspiration um, from animal-assisted therapy. Um, there's a lot of research that shows interacting with animals has had a lot of positive benefits uh, for children with autism. But animals have their own um, challenges and aren't always feasible. So maybe a robot could play some of that role and be safer. It's not going to get injured. Well, it might get injured, but it's not a live thing. It's not a live creature. So the child harms the robot. Harms the robot. Didn't hurt the dog or the person, or their brother. Shall we see the last project? OK, last one is Huggybot. And this was the doctoral thesis of Alexis Block, who graduated last August. Uh, she's now a postdoc at UCLA with Veronica Santos. Um, and these are our collaborators. Also, Hasti Safi was on the last project, also on this one. Otmar and Roger were her co-advisors at ETH. And we have published also. Uh, several papers here. Oh, yeah, she just won the Otto Hahn Medal, which is the Max Planck Society's uh, prize for doctoral students. So I'm really proud of her. We just heard a couple weeks ago. Um, so yeah, we have a few papers. And I'm going to highlight the most recent one, which is Transactions on Human-Robot Interaction, which is Huggybot 3.0. Um, but before I even get to that, you might be skeptical. Like, why would you want a hugging robot? Do you want a hugging robot? I mean, I want a hugging robot. But what you might not realize is hugging confers a lot of benefits. So if you're able to get regular hugs and other forms of physical social support, you will have a better immune system. You'll have lower stress. Your oxytocin levels will be higher. Your blood pressure will be lower. It has lots of positive health benefits. And when we're at times when we don't have hugs or other um, physical contact from people, we become more at risk for depression and other mental health problems. Our pain thresholds go down, so we actually become more sensitive to pain. Um, and we might even have, uh, have other challenges in our social lives. So hugs are a good thing. Um, you can't always, you don't always have access to people. Others have created hugging robots. When we looked through the literature, we found like three categories. There's very large animal-like robots. They often are sitting on the ground, and you have to crawl to them. Um, they're often targeted at children, and they have pretty minimal physical uh, capabilities. Um, like only they have like one joint like this. And then they also have really cool small hugging robots that you hug, but they don't act back on you. So what is known as like the therapeutic benefit of hugging and other deep pressure touch, you need to be like actively squeezed or held from the side. This is also if you like wrap yourself in a blanket, um, and has a positive impact. And so there are not that many hugging robots. Um, uh, Katsu Yamane has done some really cool work in this direction. This was Alexis's master's thesis, where we dropped that same PR2 you saw before up in a purple fluffy outfit, made it warm, and it gave hugs. And it gave very good hugs, but, uh, pretty good hugs, but it was not the ideal platform. So for Alexis's PhD, we designed and built a custom hugging robot called Huggybot. It became two, and then three, and then four. And that is what I'm going to tell you about. Over Alexis's thesis, she came up with 11 commandments or tenets, design guidelines for hugging. Um, this is actually just covered in IEEE Spectrum last week um, in a nice article. And so I will tell you about these in like just chunks, not one by one. Um, so the first ideas, and these came also from uh, the HRI paper we published last year, uh, is that these, and be soft and be warm are also in Alexis's uh, uh, master's thesis. So yeah, hugging robots, they should be soft, warm, human size, adjust to different size users, and release you when you're ready to let go. And so, <laughs> yeah, you laugh, but when that robot doesn't let you go, you really don't like it. Um, so here, these are participants in our study that was published at HRI last year. Um, and it's made, we use two Canova Jacko arms, and we kind of treat it like a grasping problem. So the hugging robot is basically like a giant gripper, and it's just closing around you. And then we watch the torque on the elbow joints and the shoulder joints. And when it gets above a threshold, we just stop. And then we can embrace you whether you're big or small, whether you're off to the left or off to the right. Um, and Huggybot's body is an inflated torso, which you can see down here. And inside, it has a pressure sensor and a microphone. So again, very, very, very minimal sensing, just a single, not even any pressure cells, just one pressure sensor. Um, so it's like omnidirectional 
pressure sensing and the robot lets go when either you lean back and it, the torque exceeds uh, some threshold or when you let go of its back. And in this study, we varied all these conditions uh, with and without the uh, releasing, with and without um, the adaptation and showed that they mattered and, and were beneficial. Um, okay, so those are the first five uh, hugging commandments. And then the next ones were the ones that we developed through Huggybot 3.0. Um, the visual perception of the user was actually important, and we didn't get it right on the first time, and then the second time we did a much better job. So we have this Intel RealSense depth camera. We just see the person. We estimate uh, their height, and you need to hug higher or lower. If the person is taller or shorter, you want to be hugged on your neck or below your waist. Um, and then also to synchronize to the user approach. So I'm not going to talk about that too much, because it makes a lot of sense when you get it right. And then instead, uh, this is the THRI paper that was accepted a couple, like a couple months ago. And it's about once you're in the embrace with the robot, we noticed that when people were holding the robot, a lot of people would like squeeze it or pat it on the back. And people do this too. And we wanted the robot to be able to communicate with the user while you're in the embrace. And so uh, here's that um, chest again. And the, acceler the pressure sensor and microphone are in the rear um, chamber. So we defined uh, four simple gestures. So there's just hold, and then patting, rubbing, and squeezing. And these were just the common things we'd seen participants do. So we collected data. We ran a big data collection study. We brought a lot of people into the lab and asked them to pat the robot, uh, rub the robot, squeeze the robot. You actually see quite a lot of variability. These are the sensor signals. The pressure is the lower one, and the microphone is the, um, sorry, pressure is the upper, and microphone is the lower. You see this person patted very, very enthusiastically, and this one also pretty, but like much less. And, People do all sorts of different things. Some people squeeze really, really hard and really long, and some people just squeeze a few times. So anyway, we got a labeled data set. We did simple supervised learning on little windows of data moving over time. Actually, a very similar algorithm to what I showed you in the previous study. And then Huggybot can run this algorithm in real time and feel what's happening. And we get very good identification on previously unseen data. It's actually, really, it works really, really well. But once Huggybot feels what you've done, Huggybot knows, ah, Harry Assad is hugging me and he patted me on the back. What should the robot do in return? And originally, we thought the robot should just reciprocate, do back to you what you did. Um, but we didn't want to make that assumption. So we actually ran a study where we had people hugging the, ro hugging the robot and tested out all the different possible combinations and had them rate how they liked, whether they loved or hated, how the robot responded. And first of all, people really like this, and they gave a lot of positive answers. The color is the average response. Uh, so you see, people like it when the robot rubs, pats, and squeezes. They especially love being squeezed by the robot. Almost everyone loves it when the robot squeezes them. But you, we would have guessed there would be a, a diagonal, and that's not at all what we found. And so uh, the most interesting thing, I think, is when the user would rub the robot or squeeze it, and the robot would respond with holding, which is doing nothing. People really don't like this. They think many people, more than half of the people, think this is a rude robot. <laughs> this robot is so rude, it doesn't even acknowledge that I patted it. I mean, some people don't mind. Um, but, um, and, but then on the other side, they really liked an affectionate, proactive robot. So if they're holding and the robot pats them or squeezes them, they, people really like this. The vast majority of people love the robot. In fact, they say they think the robot loves them, that it cares for them, that it wants them to be happy. Uh, and so we didn't at all see this diagonal that we had imagined. And so it's good that we... Um, ran the study and asked people without any assumptions. So then we programmed a simple probabilistic behavior algorithm that based on what it feels, it chooses from these with some proportion to try to add some variety, uh, but favoring answers that people tended to like. Um, and this is what it looks like all together. So this is a participant. Uh, Huggybot uh, invites him for a hug. And he goes on over. Huggybot is soft and warm. And Huggybot holds him. And now we're collecting our baseline pressure. And he's checking, is it the robot hugging me? Oh, yeah, it's hugging me. OK, he's holding still. The robot knows it's holding still. This is the arm you have to watch. OK, see, the robot is, pa is rubbing him. He's pounding on the robot's back. It's squeezing him. Sorry, I should get out of the way. Uh, now he's patting again, and the robot feels he's patting. Now he's squeezing the robot. And then he accidentally let go. He actually wanted to keep hugging. Uh, we need to prevent, uh, we should realize if we let go. But he's like, OK, now my hug is over. Uh, 
But people got to do a bunch of hugs. Here's another participant. I'll let you watch her. Uh, she also enjoys hugging the robot. These are pre-post, or these were ratings from participants uh, after a few intra hugs and at the end of the study after the concluding hugs. And you see we saw significant increases in everything. The robot already, everyone already thought the robot was very friendly. Um, it was much, they thought it was much more intelligent, much more enjoyable, and much more natural. We're getting very positive reactions. Even though it looks silly, people actually really like interacting with this robot, and it's surprisingly enjoyable. We're taking this to Hamburg for Eurohaptics in a few weeks, and then we're going to exhibit it at the Stuttgart Science Festival and hug the mayor and other local politicians, and hopefully not hurt them, and <laughs> hug members of the general public. But yeah, so this was the last project I wanted to tell you about. That's Huggybot. And like I said, it's the doctoral thesis of Alexis Block. And we have more work in progress with this too, including where we compared to real human hugs. And I can't tell you anything about that, but it was very interesting. And um, yeah, so that was this in the arms of a robot. All right, so those were the four projects I wanted to talk about. Oh, you had a question? Let's go back. Question, Sangbei. Um, so I saw the first person was much thicker. So robot couldn't quite, and the second one, like robot was Embracing. I'm just wondering, like, if you have an arm doesn't have the like rigid joint, like, uh, what if like octopus is hugging you? I wish I would love a hugging octopus. That would be great. I think the hardware of this robot uh, was not ideal. So we took these Canova Jack arms. They're very safe. They're very quiet. They're very thin. We padded them. Uh, it feels nice, but they're actually not back drivable. I wish they had been. So you're a little bit in like a padded cage uh, when the robot's holding you, but it's nice. I wish it was more compliant. Um, and I don't think it's a big deal that there are bigger and smaller people because it adapts around you and you feel embraced and um, yeah. But I would love a soft hugging robot. That would be even better. More yeah, I, more it would be more surface area. I yeah, like I think it would yeah. feel good. Um, yeah, I think I, I would be up for that. But I probably won't work anymore on hugging robots because Alexis is a postdoc and she'll apply for faculty jobs and probably make her own huggy bot 5.0, 6.0, 7.0 in the future. So I should probably go work on other things, no more hugging robots. Cause, um, but. Does anyone else have any other questions about huggy bot or other, or other things? Yeah, please. So um, you are looking a lot to the human interacting with the device, but the device, yeah. when it's like exerting different forces, would also be generating different levels of noise, vibration. Did it affect any of the work that you did? Yeah, so the question was, uh, I'm often looking at the human perception of the interaction, but the robot device would also generate different levels of vibration or noise, and does that matter? Um, you, uh, in this situation, it didn't play a big role. You're kind of asking about crosstalk or like uh, interference of the robot's own motion into the tactile sensations. Um, in this situation, when the robot's actually feeling for things, it's not making many motions. They're pretty small, and so it's not causing much of a, there's not a big path from its motor output to its sensory input. But I think generally that is a very interesting problem that we need to deal with better. Um, but it wasn't a big factor on the projects that I showed. I mean, here there's no robot and no robot. We're working on that. And here, again, we haven't actually incorporated it. But I think you're, this is a very important issue that needs to be dealt with. So, yeah. Yeah, Any Steve. Any questions? Uh, right. Oh, yeah, we should, yeah. Uh, here, you have the microphone. Whoever has the microphone has the power. Right. Oh. Uh, I love the hockey bot. Uh, and then I consider if the, I'm just curious, if you're going to, we've seen the Atlas dancing, and we might have a social dance robot because it can sense the pressure, pl pl pressure on the different links. But how sensitive should the sensors be in order to react? Because to avoid, to, to avoid my arm at this link, they might need to um, move the other links because it was the constraints there, and how do you imagine we would solve that problem so that we can have a harmonious and soft kind of dance? Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> that's a good question. And here, Huggybot certainly isn't up to that level. So we're using the torque sensors in the arms as a rather crude tactile sensor. We don't have tactile sensing on the arms, um, and we're not reacting to if the person shifts or moves. And we're nowhere near being able to dance with a robot, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, but there are, I, I, I think it's a combination of tactile sensitivity, being able to feel at the interaction, and also being able to be soft and compliant. So um, being a, 
I personally think that back ball mechanisms are probably going to be safer and more pleasant to have these nice interactions with than like these robot arms are actually rigid, non-back drivable, and it only can be in software instead of being fundamentally compliant in response. But this is just my uh, my instinct. Steve, you had a question too. Uh, how much did you have to deal with the uh, uncanny valley, both in appearance and in behavior? I think we're so far away from actual human uh, appearance that it's we're going for like a cuddly grandma, almost silly. Uh, so I don't think there's an uncanny valley. I don't think Hagiba is close to uncanny valley. I think we're pur purposely trying to not be like a human. Um, so I, how would you feel about Hagiba if it looked more like a person? Maybe it would be creepy. But what about for the motor control? For the motor control of it, it's all just hand uh, programmed. It's nothing fancy. Uh, it, the robot just like lifts and closes. It's really simple. Um, in other work, which is actually the picture that I show on the very front, the very first, which is a Baxter robot being teleoperated by a human. So we have ways of uh, live controlling robots um, and could quickly record mo motion, motions that come from humans. I don't know. I don't think the human motion would be off-putting, but this is just my, I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe in the uncanny valley for robots like this. I think, to me, the uncanny valley is more like it looks like the appearance. It's more like a human, and I don't think the motion bothers people. Or like people definitely like the robot better when it squeezes them and pats and can be intelligent and lets them go. Uh, so I think we're on the other side of the uncanny valley where improving its capabilities are still an improvement in the overall impression. But yeah, thanks. Here, do you want to pass the microphone down? I think there might be remote viewers, or this is being recorded. Please. Uh, OK. Thank you very much for the presentation. And I was curious, uh, especially on the part of tactile sensing, uh, mm -hmm. if you ever thought about like prosthetic application of these sensors, and uh, especially for upper limbs, I think it's really important. Yeah, we have an IROS paper and then an, a TNSRE paper that's in revisions right now, where we use similar tactile sensors on a prosthetic hand. And we tested with people who are intact, so people who haven't had limb loss and different kinds of haptic feedback about contact location along the finger and also the total pressure doing it. We were trying to do um, non, so this is work by Neha Thomas and Jeremy Brown. Neha was a visiting PhD student in my lab where we had people look at the wall and use this prosthetic hand, try to pick up an object and move it around and put it in a cup without looking. So we, if you have a sense of touch you and you have your hand, you can do this and people with prosthetics can't do, need to visually attend to their prosthesis to use it. So I do I fully agree. Tactile sensing is a big open area and it needs to be developed more for prosthetics and we just did this. I had this one visiting PhD student. Her PhD was all about prosthetics and we just took some of these tactile sensing approaches, kind of mostly like the electrical resistance tomography kind of put it on a prosthetic hand and looked at haptic feedback. We also, she put in some, Neha also programmed some automatic reflexes, which were very helpful. So kind of sharing control between the human and the, the autonomy. And it was a, I think it would be a good idea and it should continue. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Here. What, what do you see as the pathway towards standardization for robot skins? <laughs> I'm not the expert. I think we, uh, here, I think, well, okay. I think we're still at the early days where there are many different approaches being tried, and that makes me happy. There, at least there's a proliferation of ideas. I would love to see more comparisons between different approaches, like on the same platform, on the same tasks. That's something we hope to do with the smaller version of Insight is compare it to a biotech, compare it to a digit, compare it to um, other projectile pressure sensors that we can, tactile sensors that we can buy to really try to see when all else is equal, like what, what can we actually get and what should be, yeah, stand, I am not an expert on standardization, but it seems like a community would need to get together and like an IEEE standard would try to be formed and I'm not, I don't know what that's gonna look like, but it could be an interesting thing. I think that it should happen. I don't, does anyone know anything about the history of cameras and how they became so standardized? And was it really a messy thing in the beginning where there are all kinds of cameras and then it's standardized on one thing? Because I, I have to imagine that must have happened. And yeah. then we're 
some some things will win, and, and then there will maybe be some fringe ideas. Hopefully, we'll get the best of all the different approaches and make it really robust. And and yeah, so well, let's see. We're young. We have more more years ahead of us. Um, those are my thoughts. Yeah, looking at the history of some other things. I was saying cameras because it's another sensory technology where you want an, you're streaming a lot of data and you want to kind of both on the hardware and then on the software side, but try to come to a standard. But maybe it's much harder than a camera because uh, the body surface of a robot is going to be different. It's this topology is totally different for every robot or different body parts. So that's probably why it makes it sort of more difficult. But we're going in a good direction, I think. Yeah. Uh, a lot of your projects have used machine learning as, well, like, supervised notably because you actually have to label it. And I imagine simulating touch is thoroughly difficult, and yeah. there's been advances in locomotion mm -hmm. by being able to simulate those dynamics. Do you see value in developing touch simulators? Yeah. Uh, we are working on a simulator for Insight, or we have an intern coming to hopefully make an intern. A, 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 um, a simulator for Insight, Georg Marcius, who's my collaborator on that, is much more of a learning expert than I, ha I am, and he really uh, and he was also involved in the project with ER Tech, where we have a simulator to try to reduce the number of experiments that we need to do and try to use simulation and bridge that gap. So this is definitely something that I'm interested in, um, and that I think it will work. Uh, yeah, that I think it will be beneficial, and yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I feel bad we've gone a little bit over. I didn't mean to talk. I, when I made this talk originally, it was a 45 minute talk, and then it, got, it grew today because you guys have been such a great audience. I did also pause to take questions along the way because I found that to be more interactive when there's a real audience here. Does anyone have any further questions, or shall we end? Maybe I can show my thank you slides. So that was the list. Oh, we don't need to go through this. You can just see these are some concluding ideas. Oh, wait, here. You should see it at least for a moment. These are some concluding ideas. Touch is important. And we need broad spatial bandwidth and high temporal bandwidth. You can use just a few sensors to instrument large body parts. We need to be able to react in real time. And yeah, that's my team from October. It's a lovely group of people. Come visit us. In, I mean, this is when we were last allowed to actually stand all together and be in close proximity without masks. Um, so please, if you're ever in Stuttgart, come visit us and say hi. Um, and yeah, thank you to everyone who organized this and who helps our research in many different ways. And with that, I'll be happy to finish.